Welcome to our program on Kardec Radio. So let's open ourselves in prayer, closing our eyes and opening our hearts and feeling the presence of Jesus here with us, feeling the presence of all the good spirits, our guardian angels, all of the friends in the spiritual realm that have come to assist us on this night in this beautiful meeting to learn more about the truth of the eternal life and life in the spirit world. We ask that our hearts and minds remain open to learn what may be ours to receive and to put into action, especially about cooperation, which is our subject for tonight, from the book Thought and Life. So may our hearts and minds cooperate in our soul's evolution to put into practice what we have learned. May God bless each and every one of us, blessing all the brothers and sisters in the spirit realm that are also here with us. I'm blessing the environment of our homes and all of our loved ones, that light may be in us and all around us. May God bless us all. So be it. So welcome everyone. I'm so glad that you're all here tonight for this talk on Thought and Life, Chapter 3, which is called Cooperation. And this is the book. It is available also in English. You can get it from the Spiritist Group of New York, so sgny.org. I think it's about $10.00. Um, It's a small book with each chapter is maybe like one or two pages, but it's very, what's the word? It's very compact in its, and, and concentrated, that's the word I'm looking for. It's very concentrated. There's no wasted words. So some books are full of a lot of information. There's lots of extra words. Every word means something powerful in this book. So there's, that's how we can have on just one or two pages, you know, a whole, a whole conversation about it. And that's what we're going to do tonight. And we wanted to review a little bit from the, the past two chapters, because this is now chapter three. So from the introduction, we learned about the purpose of this book. So Emmanuel told us, um, this book is, sorry for not mentioning that, it's it's by um, the spirit author Emmanuel as dictated to the Brazilian medium and psychographer Chico Xavier. And so Emmanuel transmitted to Chico Xavier that the purpose of this book was to assist souls in the spirit world to prepare them for reincarnation. And not just that, but also to, in this process of preparing new souls for reincarnation um, as a guidance to the wisdom and love of God, and to help us to learn how to elevate our thoughts to the wisdom of love and God. And so what's interesting about this is that this is a book to prepare a new soul to reincarnate. And in this time in the spirit world, when souls are preparing to reincarnate, this is not a happy time right? Because it's known, you know, how dense and difficult life in physical bodies on the crust of this earth is. But yet here, us on the physical plane, you know, we cry when someone dies, right? We think like that's the end of life when it's, and then the spirit world, when someone discarnates, it's, it's a beautiful thing because we know there's a return to the spirit life where we're free from this physical body and we have this opportunity to regenerate. So, you know, really is all about perspective, right? So if keeping that perspective in mind, when we think about that being the introduction to the book and the purpose of this book was to help souls learn how to adapt to this physical life, this brings a lot for us as we're already incarnated as to how we can make the most of this physical life that we have. And so chapter one talked about the mind as a mirror of life. Not just that the mirror is reflecting the images that we project and we receive, but also that our life projects the constant thoughts and the constant images that we project and receive. So it's it's telling us that when we look at our lives, we're also learning about our thoughts and the images that we hold. And in chapter one, we learned that 
the, is that in three different levels of elevation, so in primitive beings, right, that our minds are hidden in like primitive animal instincts. And in the human soul, right, as we emerge, that we are full of, you know, illusions. But in spirits who have perfected themselves, the mind becomes like a brilliant diamond that is like reflecting divine glory. And this is our invitation and a reminder from chapter one that as the soul progresses from primitive to, to intermediate to on its, on its road to perfection, and it's traveling you know, from, from right to left, that as we think through what images and, and what kind of life do we wanna project outward, what kind of thoughts do we wanna to have to produce the kind of life that we want, that we have to think through our thoughts themselves, right? And, and to take time to evaluate our thoughts and, and make sure that when we're thinking left to right, you know, if I do this thing, or if I think this thing, or if I say this thing, you know, how will I feel? If I feel this, how will I act? If I do this action, what will be the result? Will it cause me to grow spiritually? Will I stay stuck? Will I incur more debt, right? Will I produce harm? So these are the, some of the things that we explored in chapter one. And then in chapter two, we talked about the, well, I thought this was so interesting, right? That chapter two talked about the mind as an office, like an office building or a company, right? With many different departments. So some of those departments were like the department of desire, um, see if I can remember intelligence, desire, will. And the intention of chapter two is that we begin to increase our self-awareness and we increase our self-awareness by using our will right, to be the, like, the captain or the, the, the manager of all of these different departments and to become aware of how to build our will. So that's kind of what we had behind us from our last two lessons, all through the lens of the intention of this book being to prepare a new soul to reincarnate, which means it's just as valuable for us that have that are incarnated, that are here in these bodies, doing our best to, to have a life that is impactful. Because if you think about it, one of the things that we learn in spiritism through our study of spiritism is that the intention of each incarnation is that we are here for the intentions of our soul to evolve. Like this is the purpose of our incarnation. So we have always have at least one milestone, one major lesson for us to learn in this particular incarnation. And so one of the ways that we can have a, a clue to what those, to what that plan was. Um, Raphael, can you help me with the mute, please? Thank you. One of the, one of the clues that we can find as to what the intention for our incarnation was or what the major milestone or major lesson for us was, is if we look in our lives and we look back on our lives and we think what has been like a consistent challenge? Usually there's at least one thing that consistently is a problem for us. And that is a good clue as to what it is we may need to be working on. And so if we think about this book being designed to help any soul who reincarnates be able to work through whatever their challenge is and to be able to learn whatever that major lesson is, this also applies for us because here we are and that consistent challenge that we have has an opportunity for us to apply what we're learning today to that challenge. So just keep that in the back of your mind as we continue on through our talk today about cooperation. So, you know, when we think about this idea of our mind as an office with the will in charge, right? For someone to successfully run an organization, right? For someone to successfully run a big company, it's not enough to just be put into that position. It's not enough to just be nominated or appointed or get the job. We see a lot of leaders of organizations that just because they have the position doesn't mean that they're a good leader, right? That's not the only thing that's required is just to actually get the job, right? There's a combination of many qualities that is required for an enterprise or an organization or a life, right, to prosper. So it's not just the authority, right, but also, also guidance and discernment. So let's talk about those two things real quick. Guidance is the idea that we can, on this road of life, that we would guide. You can even see that this, the picture of this, this woman with two different roads, like which road do I choose, right? There has to be something guiding which road is, 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 is chosen. And every choice is like that. Every decision is like that. We can choose one thing or we can choose another. Some 
opportunities to make choices. We have have mul- more than two roads, have multiple roads. But at any point, we need to make a choice. And what is guiding that decision, right? What is guiding that? And then discernment, right? Discernment is as I'm guiding myself, how do I know where I should guide myself to, right? The discernment is which of those roads might have the intended destination that is someplace I'm actually wanting to go. So discernment is that faculty that we talked about on the last slide and also in uh, chapter one, the capacity to think right to left. If I do this, then what will happen? And then what's the logical outflow? That discernment process helps us to think through to the end what the most logical outcome is and then whether that's actually for our good. So it's not just authority, it's not just guidance, it's not just discernment. And it also says not only theory and culture, but virtue and clear judgment as well as a sense of proportion. So now this is more sounding artistic now, right? Like theory and culture, like theory is the the, the study of something, but it's not necessarily putting it into practice. And culture is the things that make life beautiful, the different ways that we live. But now we're getting into two things like virtue, which is the opposite of vice, right? Vices produce harm to the body, mind, and spirit and to the people around us. And virtues are those things that produce spiritual growth, that produce good things around us, and also um, produce good qualities for ourselves. So when we think about virtues, we think about things like patience and kindness and unselfishness and resignation and, and, and moral charity and and tolerance and mercy and benevolence. And, and so like these are some of the virtues, right? And clear judgment, not just any kind of judgment, but clear judgment, because we talked about this on Saturday, you know, like we're judgment making machines and it's really easy to judge your neighbor. It's really easy to judge other people. But clear judgment is this idea of, I'm just evaluating the situation and I'm using my guidance and discernment to know what to do as well as a sense of proportion. And this is the idea of doing things in balance because too much of anything is not a good thing, right? We wanna make sure that there is proportion in terms of how we are making decisions. So all of this is talking about what is needed to be a good leader. And before we go on, I would like to ask you all, if you could please put in the chat or you can speak up. There's obviously more than this, but I would love to hear from you. Can I ask a question? I can type it out and wait. Yes, absolutely. Ask your question, Brandon. And then I wanna ask you all a question, which is what else does a good leader need? And I'd love to hear it in the chat or speak it out. But Brandon, what's up? Hi, thank you so much for taking my question. Um, Can you hear me okay? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, good. Um, So if, if you have to make a decision and when you think of going in the direction of that option, you feel tension as opposed to I'm not sure I'm hearing your whole question. You're saying if you feel tension as opposed to what? Oh, Brandon, I think you cut out there is like the best decision about it? Is that typically always, should you trust that that's probably not the best decision? Like when you have to make a decision on which house to buy or you know how you get the feeling of sort of, you feel tense when you move in the direction of choosing a certain option as opposed to another. Should your feeling of being apprehensive be enough to make you say, maybe the other option is better? I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, you broke up a little bit in there, but I think the question that that I'm hearing is when you make a decision, if one option makes you feel tense, should that be a guiding post? We talked about this some last week uh, in our study, which I don't think you're in that class. Here's the thing. I I don't think there's any one clear answer as to what should guide your, how to make a decision. I can say two things. One is that whenever there's a really tough decision, pray, pray, pray to pray to pray that your guardian angel would help you pray to Jesus to help you have a clear head around it. And as you evaluate your decision, one good evaluation methodology is, will the results of this decision produce love and will it produce the highest good for the greatest number of people? And only you can answer that, right? Because sometimes stress isn't necessarily a bad thing because doing the right thing isn't always easy, which is why we have so much chaos in the world. So I wouldn't know that stress is necessarily the, the, the right indicator. I would always say, pray, pray some more, and evaluate how much love and unselfishness and charity is in the decision. And those are usually good guideposts. But in the end, the decision is up to you and it'll require you you in cooperation with your will, right? And having um, some clear judgment about it. 
Thank you for, for that I answer. I, I really appreciate that. Thanks. Yep, absolutely. And I hope that helps. Um, and so please um, also, if you um, have um, uh, any other questions, you can ask them, you can put them in the chat at any time. Um, I have no problem. I think the more questions you ask, the more we can learn from each other as well. I do not promise to have all the answers, but we can certainly take the questions and uh, and, and see what, what, what we can, can manifest today. And so feel free again to put any questions in the chat, as well as I would love to hear um, if you can put them in the chat or you can speak them into the space and unmute, um, what other qualities of a good leader are needed besides, oh, I understand, Brandon, besides authority, guidance, discernment, theory, culture, virtue, clear judgment. Curious to hear what you all think. I'm gonna keep going, but I'll check the chat to hear um, from time to time to hear, because this is also going to be the, the theme for our talk tonight. So when we think about some other qualities that are needed, right? An administrator or leader should irradiate or embody, right? The forces of justice and goodness, work and discipline in order to reach the objectives of the positions that he holds, right? So let's think about this. Justice and goodness, work and discipline. So justice is the idea to be fair, a good moral compass. Yes, Bill, absolutely, I love that. Um, and, and work and discipline, right? So this is, so being, being just, and being good are often two different things, right? So having them together is important. And working is important, we all know this, but working with discipline is another thing, right? So in order to reach the objectives of running a large organization, we need to see a leader with these things because we've seen leaders that are not good or that are not just or that are undisciplined or that don't work. We've all observed or heard about leaders like this and we see that it doesn't produce the results that are positive for that organization. And also, we've also seen when authority gets abused, right? And then people suffer, right? This causes chaos in the environment and, and, it, and it takes away the tranquility and peace and causes disturbances, right? And I love this quote from Dr. King, right? Is that, that, we, that it's intelligence plus character, right? That's not only the goal of a true education, I think it's also the goal of a good leader. But if the function of education is to teach us how to think intensively and to think critically, right? And that intelligence and character are those two guideposts. I think this tells us two things. One, it tells us the importance of study, right? It's the importance of spiritism as the school of the soul, which we call it. And also, I think this idea that we are thinking intensively and thinking critically as a way to build intelligence and character. Because how Dr. King is saying character is really how we see in, in, in spiritism morality, right? We say if someone grows morally, but not intellectually, you know, that's not a bad thing because that person still has a, as I love what Bill said, a good moral compass, right? You can still lead an organization through love and through good morals. But if you have someone who's intelligent without the morals, you can still lead, but the results are disastrous. Whereas the leader who was a, has good morals, but without um, a highly developed intelligence, I'm not going to be a lot of disaster because you can staff the morality. You, know, you can staff the intelligence. It's hard to staff, you know, the, the morality if the leader is making that decision. And so, one other thing to think of, right? That if not only if intelligence lacks the guidance of good character, then misery and cruelty will result. Now, we're talking hypothetically about an organization, but really, the organization we're talking about is us, right? We're really talking about how are we leading our lives. Right, and I and one thing that, you know, my my I've heard my children say before is, oh, my sister's making me so mad, and you know, they're, they're, she's annoying me, and and they would be annoyed when I would say, how can someone make you mad? Right, it's a choice that we make. We are leading our own lives, and did that land well with my children? No, right. But as adults, yeah, I think they they probably have a better listening for it. And the same thing happens, you know, in, in my workplace when there is one worker that's complaining about another worker. Oh my gosh, you know, I can't believe they, they just, you know, they, they make me feel like they're just making me feel like my day is just ruined. How can a person make you do that? We are leading our own lives. We are making the choices. However, when these situations happen in our lives, when people act like when one of my daughters is acting unskillfully that, and the other one reacts or at work when someone's acting unskillfully or acting without any of these qualities that allow us to lead our lives in a positive way, then we see this misery and cruelty. We have to ask ourselves, what must be done? 
We cannot lead anybody else's lives, but we can lead our own. And this is what we're talking about today. How do we lead our own lives? Through our will. The will is like the captain, right? If we think about this, the will is like the captain of a ship. If we put a whole bunch of resources at the service of a mind that is not balanced, that's like putting treasure in the arms of someone insane. This is all this is directly from the book, right? So if we think about this, we, our will is the leader of our body, leader of our lives. And so if we think about this now as a ship, right? Riches without direction resemble a ship without a destination. And so we have all these riches, maybe not physical riches, maybe many of us are not physically rich, but we have a lot of blessings in our lives. We have a lot of blessings in our lives. We have the blessing of life in and of itself. And we have, we have this, we talked already about this mind as a office with all of these different rooms. And it's also like this, our whole life is like this ship. Well, who is running this ship? And what is our destination? It is up to us to decide, right? We know that we've seen many tyrants who have these great intellects, but they are steeped in vice and they produce all of these, these poor outcomes. We've seen this, that's like the one side of it, but we still have the choice in our lives, right? In our innermost world, inside of us, right? Our will is like the captain who can't afford to neglect those duties. And I mean, you all have seen this, right? I, I don't know if I'm the only one, but I've seen more than once in my children, and I've seen it in other people's children. You ever see a child run at full speed while they're looking over their shoulder? It's one of the craziest things you can ever see because you're like, look in front of you, what are you doing? But the way that we live our lives is sometimes like that. Like we're running full speed without really looking where we're going. We're not really checking the destination. We are like these ships on these stormy seas without really going for the steering wheel. And we can change that, right? Because it's our will that can reach out for that steering wheel. It's our will that can choose that. And so, and if our will, like I love what Bill said, is a good moral compass, then that gives us some options. Oh, I want to see what Paul said, that have the habit of listening and asking for true feedback of how they're leading. Yes, the ability to do that. Yes, yes, yes. That's why we need each other. And that's more about cooperation, which we're all going to talk about. But if we think about, you know, who are the, the, the will, right? The, the, if we think about the, the will being a, a, a captain and that we think about the life being this ship, then the captain needs a good map needs a good navigation system, right? And, and our map and that navigation system, that's now that moral compass. Bill, I don't know if you saw these slides beforehand, but you were onto something, right? But also, just like an administrator needs good and honest coworkers, the, the will itself needs some respected counselors, right? Which are, if we think about, remember we need like guidance and discernment, what's guiding the will in its decision-making processes? And now Brandon, we get a little closer to the answer to your question, but it ultimately the answer of course is up to us. But one of them is ponderation. Ponderation is uh, defined as, I had to look this up because that's not a common word in the English language, is careful thought, especially before making a decision or reaching a conclusion. And, um, and so this is like the idea of like, if we are quick to act without any ponderation, then it becomes easy to uh, make, a, make a choice that doesn't produce, produce the results that we want. But then again, the other that is needed is logic, right? This is like the quality of being justifiable by reason. So when we start evaluating our decisions, um, we wanna make sure that the will is being guided by those two things, right? Is, is to give it things careful thought, as well as applying logic. And I, I would like to think also is adding like the veil of those two things that I add, which is, is this going to produce love? Is this going to, is this a selfish decision? And is it only gonna produce benefits for just me or is there gonna be benefits to, um, to, to multiple people? But it's essential that this, a sense of cooperation be called upon to sustain our impulses because this idea of our will working with ponderation and logic is part of the initial phase of cooperation that we're going to talk about today. Because if we don't have that sense of cooperation with our respected counselors to our will, then our impulses will run a buck. And then now that's the, the pathway and device and we know we're trying to, to go the other direction so that our souls can evolve. So this part of the book is interesting. It talks about um, sort of some of the natural interdependencies that we have. So it says like, you know, in earthly life, we know that everything coexists. Right, and um, it gives this example of a sweater, right, which needs the thread, right, and the thread needs the machine, and the machine needs the technician, and the operator, the factory that needs the industry. All of these things cooperate together in order to produce a sweater, 
So a sweater has many different elements that are a collection of different kinds of cooperation. And that's just a sweater. I mean, if you look around your home, everything in your home took cooperation to produce that particular object. And there's this idea of spontaneous cooperation, right, which is the supreme ingredient of order. Now, spontaneous cooperation is when I don't have to say, hey, you know, can you do this? Can you help me out? It's when we're naturally helping each other. And this is really now the center of what we want to talk about today. And there's this idea of like cooperation as interbeing. Interbeing is a, a term from, from Buddhist philosophy. And, and it's like this idea that, and this is um, from, a, um, um, from, from mindfulness, also from one of my favorite teachers, Thich Nhat Hanh. And that's this idea that an interbeing, that clouds and trees together make paper. Clouds and trees, how could that possibly work, right? Well, without a cloud, there's no rain. Without rain, no trees. Without trees, no paper. Right? So the cloud is essential for the paper, right? They, they enter R. They, this is like an idea of, of, of things coexisting. And if you remove all of the cloud elements from that paper, then the paper ceases to exist. But take this a step further, right? What about the, the person who plants the tree? What about the, um, what about the, 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 the machines that made the paper? every single step of the way, just like with the sweater, there's like this interbeing. And so we can say that, you know, even like if sunshine is not there, like the forest can't grow. If the, if the clouds are not there, the tree cannot grow. So we are also like this as human beings, we are like this, right? We enter arc as well, right? And our co active cooperation with each other in the good is part of our collective good. Now, I'm going to say that again. It's our cooperation with each other in the good, right? And that's part of our collective good because there's also cooperations and things that are not good, but that's not what we're talking about tonight. So now let's talk about cooperation and service, right? Which is really the, the key here. That with the help of a strong will, one can always find a few minutes and a few opportunities during the week to do the good. This is from the messengers, right? So, and I love this quote from Muhammad Ali, right? The service we due to others is the rent that we pay, you know, for our room here on earth. But look at this quote from, from Andre Luis. A strong will, we can find a few minutes and a few small opportunities during the week to do good. If we think about this in the broader context, right, that our life, you know, that, that what we learned in chapter one, that the mind is, is, the, is the mirror of life. Chapter two, the, this, this office that we're running and the, that is being run by the will. In chapter three, the importance of cooperation. And if we put this all in the broader context of our need to make something of this life that is going to produce our spiritual evolution and hopefully to do well on the thing that we came here to do, at a minimum, we're going to be required to work together in cooperation and service, that this is the doorway now for us to get closer to that thing that we're here to do to grow ourselves spiritually. And this is, Andre Luisa is telling us, a strong will in just a few minutes and a few small opportunities to do the good. So this isn't like a really big ask. I just want to just plant the seed. This is not a big ask, right? And that cooperation is necessary for evolution, right? So now we talk about, you know, one example of what cooperation is. And this is constructive collaboration. Which constructive means you're building something that's positive to face challenges and provide wholehearted help to put deprivation behind us, right? And, and if we think about this, <clears throat> if, when we're cooperating, we're helping, the idea is to create an abundance of love. It's not necessarily deprivation of physical things, although one of the ways we cooperate is to help to bring, you know, um, physical things for those who need it. But it's this deprivation of love. Right. And, you know, another example of this is um, uh, in the book Nasolar, I think it was chapter 13, where Andre Louise and this this woman go to visit Minister Clarencio to get permission to 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 do some work and to get help. And the the woman who was asking for help, she got to go first. And so Andre Louise is listening to her and she asks for help to uh, ask for permission to go and help her family. And the minister denies her request because she said he told her that, you know, if you want to help others, you first, if you want permission to like to go on this mission, you have to have shown 
that you are capable of helping others here and that you are doing the work and you are cooperating because those who do not cooperate cannot receive cooperation. In order for her to go help her family, she was gonna need the help of a lot of other spirits to help her make that trip, to support her um, while she's helping her family. She wouldn't be able to do that alone, but she hadn't been helpful or cooperative or doing any work while she was in the spiritual colony. So her request got denied. And what he told her was that those who do not cooperate cannot receive cooperation. And, as is, and the flip side of this, of course, is like we see here on the screen that those who help others will themselves be helped. This is an odd conundrum, right? Because when we are helping other people, our whole vibration changes. And sometimes it's just a very shift in our vibration. It's the not worrying about all of our personal problems and the unselfish presence and offering of help to others. That actually is the help that we need to come out of our own selfishness, right? And Emmanuel is telling us here that the souls who help others will find that this is the most secure formula for readjustment in this evolutionary process. Now, let's think about the purpose of this book. It's to help us, help new souls who are, re or help souls that are preparing to reincarnate. We're here, already reincarnated. We're trying to turn our lives into a positive, spiritually, evolution uh, um, evolving process and we want to help other people and this is what what we're being told we just got the formula and not just any kind of formula i did not write these words cooperation means constructive collaboration those who help will be helped and that this is the most secure formula for readjusting in this evolutionary process so this is pretty simple yes question um, you made me think about something so um I was talking to a friend, you know, months ago, and, and we were kind of sad because she was moving to a different town. And you know how sometimes at some point in your life, you just have this feeling that, you know, all your good friends, they are like far away from you. And then, you know, we were, we got to this point that we were like just discussing the role that people, different people have in our life. And she said something that it was, it was quite beautiful, that she, she said that she believes that we play important roles in each other's lives. Like sometimes you don't, re you don't even realize that you have an important role in someone's life. For instance, if you are a manager, as you were giving the example, and someone was applying for a job and you decided to give the opportunity to this person, maybe you don't realize, but you might have changed the whole life of this person. And in the same way, you know, when we are talking in here in helping and how we cooperate and we contribute for the whole is like also in this meaning how sometimes we as friends, we help people or, you know, sometimes your friendship's not going to be for the whole life, but for a certain period of, you know, months and years, you are going to have this active role in someone's life and you are really going to help that person to grow and to develop. And I don't know, that was really beautiful. And um, your talk made me think about that. I love that, Andriana. It's so true. We And what I love about what you said, Andriana, is that we don't ever really know the role that we are playing in people's lives, which is why it's so important to show up and do as much good as possible. Because if we're just doing a little bit of good, then that's possibly a little impact. But if we can do a lot of good in someone's life, how much of an impact could that be? Yeah, I love that. Thank you. And so then there's this idea of spiritual cooperation. So we've talked about cooperating, our will cooperating with the decision-making process. We've talked about our, our, our cooperation with like, helping others. But then there's this idea of spiritual cooperation, right? So this is also from the messengers. And, and Chico Xavier is, uh, this is um, Andre Louise also um, speaking in this book, saying that in all areas of evolution, it's natural that the sincere and effective worker should receive increasingly ample resources. This isn't how it always works in corporate America, right? We see a lot of people who are well paid but don't really do a lot of work. Or maybe a bunch of people doing the same job, but one person works harder but they don't get any more money, right? So, so this doesn't, we don't see this parallel like on the physical plane, but on the spiritual plane, it is abundantly fair, right? That, uh, that every effective worker increases, receives increasingly ample resources. But the second bullet is the one I want us to pay attention to. Wherever activity for the good is found, a higher order of spiritual cooperation will be found there. 
Now let's think about that. If it is that we are in the act of doing good, we are cooperating, we are, we are following the formula that we just got told, the most secure formula, right? Which is cooperation, it means constructive collaboration, helping to build the good, right? Helping people face challenges, providing wholehearted help, helping others, that a higher order of spiritual cooperation will be found there. Let's think about this. If that is the case, right? And if there's a higher order of spiritual cooperation that would be found there, well, what does that really mean, you know, for us? There's this idea that we don't ever have to do this alone. We've talked about the fact that there are multiple brothers and sisters without bodies around us at any time, that the life in the spirit world is always active and life in the world around us, that there are many more brothers and sisters without bodies that, but there are still alive and souls that are here with us right now that, that then, then we can see, unless you're one of the mediums that has this particular gift of mediumship. So we're never alone. So if we are engaged in the act of good, this is telling us, right? So a sincere and effective worker. Now we can't just be in the act of good for, for any old reason, right? Sincere means like for the purposes of producing a positive result. Um, but if sincere and effective that we're working for the good, we're doing it for the purpose of just doing the good. We're doing it with an open heart. And we are effective in this and that we are, that we are providing assistance with an open and a loving heart, that that also is producing, it's saying, right? Wherever activity for the good is found, a higher order of spiritual cooperation will be found there. So this brings us some, some very interesting information. So when we think about this, um, that the that helpers expect us to help, right? So here's some pictures of some of our, our, um, our members of our Spiritist Center doing spiritual work. And this says that all of us incarnated and discarnate appear in the Spiritist Center with the intention of receiving, receiving help. But the messengers also equally await our help in supporting others. And our cooperation with them will always be above all to work, to serve, to assist, and to comprehend. So let's talk about this for a minute. So we're all here, right? We're all here, we're here, even though we're virtual, right? But we're here in this kind of virtual Spiritist Center. And we're here because we wanna learn. We're, we know that there's been spirits here helping us. We're here to receive help. But also remember, they're waiting for us to help supporting others. Now, if we go back to this previous slide, wherever activity for the good is found, a higher order of spiritual cooperation will be found there. We talked earlier about what, um, what that minister and also Lar told, I think it was Minister Clarencio told Andre Luis and, and also Lar that, uh, or told the woman who, don't remember her name, but told the woman who wanted to permission to, to go on a mission that only those who cooperate can expect cooperation. We learned on this slide that if you are cooperating for the good, that a higher order of spiritual cooperation will be there. What we learn here is that as we're coming for help, then we'll, we'll receive that cooperation, but in exchange for that cooperation, there's an expectation that we're going to be assisting in doing the good. I'm gonna stop there because that's a lot. That's a lot of cooperation. Oh, you know what cooperation just means? It just means help. It just means do the good. Do what you can. It talked to, you know, a few slides ago that, you know, a strong will can find a few minutes each, you know, each week to do a little bit of good. Um, oh, what does this say? Cooperation is not about reward, but about accomplishment. Yes, Giselle, so true. So very true. And I think what, what Giselle is, is speaking to there also is, um, that uh, this is also part of the, being an effective worker, right? It's, it's, it's about the accomplishment and, and the sincerity part is to, to do good because it, because why? Because it feels good. I can tell you that, that the folks who've been participating in the charity work, we can tell you that, it, that it, it feels really good to be of assistance. And wherever you are, even if you're not here in this physical location in North Carolina where we're doing this work, it is so easy to find a few minutes each week to do some good for someone. And by the way, it's not as though you have to, you know, brave the elements and go and, and, and work with the homeless if you are the kind of person that still feels a little bit uncomfortable given the state of the world health situation. This kind of work may, would make you feel uncomfortable. There are still 
many, many opportunities. One of the things that we're doing at our Spiritist Center as well is um, um, in, an online food drive, right? Where we like during the, on Saturdays we meet um, at two o'clock and we send out electronic requests for donations, right? And then we do contactless pickups, you know, the following Saturday, and then we distribute them. So this is something potentially you could do in your city if you're not doing that, um, or you could participate with us and we can show you how we do it. So if you have this kind of feeling in your heart that you might maybe might want to be um, participating in, in some uh, some activity, you know, we can we'd be happy to 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 show you that. You can join us at two o'clock on um, every Saturday using the same Zoom every Saturday two p.m. So I just wanted to put that out there, and I want to see what else. I'm just like I said here. It's the only way to stretch um, to stretch our wings. Oh my gosh, I love that. I love that. Yes, because really think about it. When you're spreading your wings, you know what's happening? We're no longer holding everything close to our chest. Yes, and, and makes us able to fly. I love that. Yes, and, and even pray. This is a beautiful way to start. I love it. Yes, yes. Oh my God, the chat is blowing up. I'm loving y'all. Love, 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 love this. So, so I'm going to pause here because the last slide is, um, is our message. So this is really the last slide. I would love to just stop and see what questions anyone has, any other comments, if anybody has any questions about the, the, the charity work that the center does and, or um, questions about service opportunities, any questions about the idea of cooperation. It says, leave it to the Pisces to say we're flying. I love it, Brandon, I love it. Yes, but we actually are. And the, and to the level of elevation that we reach is going to depend on how much good we do. Because we already learned today that the, the formula, the most secure formula for readjustment in this evolutionary process is cooperation in constructive collaboration, right? It's doing the good. And when we do the good, we have not only ample resources, but a high amount of spiritual cooperation. So I'll just pause to see if there's any other uh, questions, comments before we um, do our last message and then go on to the past treatment? Okay. Seek out true north on the compass. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, if it's one thing if we've got our compass, but it's entirely another thing to actually follow it, right? I love that, Bill. That's like, you know, you have the steering wheel, but are you using? Uh, the ponderation and the logic to guide it, right? Are we using all those other virtues that a leader needs? Are we using our moral compass, right? Not just any old compass, but are we looking at true north on the moral compass? And are we doing that with love and with virtue and with um, and with, with with kindness and sincerity? I love that. Okay. So here is our message for today um, from Living Spring. So goodwill and cooperation are two master columns in the edifice of human fraternity so that the earthly mind might be put into harmony with the divine mind. An invaluable plan has been revealed. Education, spiritually constructive reading, instructive lectures, a contagious example in the practice of simple goodness, the dissemination of consoling and instructive books. May our primary endeavor be the awakening of inner personal qualities. Let us help others do all they can to improve social progress in their own sphere and activity, to guide the thought, to enlighten and sublimate it is to guarantee the redemption of the world, unveiling new rich horizons for ourselves. Let us assist the mental life of the multitude and we will all meet Jesus more easily for the victory of life eternal. So that is what we had time for tonight. We are going to go on to our past treatment next. I wanted to just pause one more time and see if there were any more thoughts before we did that. Is there something in the chat? The guides always cheer up for our cooperation to become one with them. Yes, I absolutely love that. So please, friends, go and get your water if you don't have it already to put some water by your side so that we can go on to the past treatment. Let's now prepare for the passes. Let's prepare ourselves now for the moment of the passes and the blessing of our water. 
place by your side a container with clean water to be blessed and magnetized. Dear brothers and sisters, no matter where you are in this moment, what difficulties you're facing, Jesus is always ready to come to our help. Place yourself now in a comfortable position, one that facilitates concentration and receptivity. Breathe slowly and calmly. Inhale and exhale. Inhale and exhale. Fill your lungs with air and release slowly. Let the energy of tranquility and peace penetrate your lungs and circulate throughout your body. Your soul, in harmony with your body, feels peaceful and at peace. Let us think now about the passage of Jesus among us. In a beautiful and clear day, the golden rays of the sun illuminating the joyful landscape Multicolored flowers, bouncing, chirping birds fill the landscape with optimism. The news of the cures brought a crowd of needy people around Jesus. Suddenly, Jesus appears, calm and serene. His white tunic is light and long all the way up to his feet. At the sunset, all those who were sick and affected by different diseases were brought to him. And Jesus, laying his hand on each one, healed them, as narrated in the Gospel of Luke. Let's mentalize now Jesus approaching us in this moment, placing his friendly hands on top of your head. Feel the presence of this Divine Master right with you, feeling like a waterfall of pure and crystalline waters start to fall from His hands, coming from His love to bathe you, falling on your head, streaming down your shoulders, bathing your whole entire being, bringing you peace, serenity, and balance, cleaning all impurities and pacifying yourself. Feel this water bathing you, cleansing and purifying. Breathe. Now think of Jesus as a sun bright before you, his light, his warmth, embracing you, enveloping you. Feel the healing emerging emanating from Christ towards you. He hears your prayers. Trust Him. His love is infinite. He is always by your side, protecting, offering everything you need. Trust Him. Feel and absorb all these magnificent healing energies coming from Jesus in this moment. His light surrounds and embraces you. Feel these energies running throughout your body. Feel yourself re-energized, strengthened, and at peace. Dear Lord Jesus, our divine friend, extend your generous hands, Lord, and transform these waters into remedies for our physical and spiritual ailments. Hold us, Jesus, in your peace. Extend your vibrations of love for the benefit of my home, dear Lord. May peace, health, tranquility reign here with my family. We give thanks to you, Jesus, and pray that you stay with us today and always. Thank you, God. So let's close now in prayer.
Dear Jesus, we thank you for your loving presence with us here tonight. Thank you for all of the messages that we received about the importance of cooperation. And we ask for the awareness and the courage to put what we've learned into practice that we would enter into right relationship with our own will and use our will to manage the various functions of our mind, that we would cooperate for the good, that we would find time each week to do something that helps others, to help produce the collective good for collective humanity. Anything that we can find time for, let us have the courage and the will to put ourselves at the assistance of our brothers and sisters. And whatever resistance we have to this, we offer it up to the Lord with an open heart and open hands, asking for help to dissolve it, that we could find ourselves cooperative, collective workers for the good. May God bless each and every one of us to continue onward in our journey to evolve by helping one another. Let us remember the most important teaching from Jesus, love one another the same way we love God. May God bless each and every one of us. So be it. <laughs>